testing. One, two. Coming through. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Five hours on a day. And uh, I'm going to have some good stuff. Jacksonville that uh, uh, we got for our church group and then came three SWAT attacks over that deal uh, generally speaking <laughs> the uh, uh, it's a pretty pretty big place and uh, uh, we would have had plenty of room for, for our church group and then it had lots of offices and classrooms and everything, and we would have been able to teach, 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 you know, and uh, uh, make a real difference. But uh, now I'm having to work to recapture that thing because, uh, you know, they put me through three years of intense litigation to basically uh, save my own life. and. Uh, uh, they're they're unbelievably bad in Cherokee County, and as it is all across the country. Uh, these guys in Cherokee County are so bad. Uh, those who know Ray McKelton know that the guy's, you know, really excellent, awesome in the law. Can run circles around a lot of attorneys. Uh, but uh, even Randy Kelton got convicted in, in Cherokee County. And, not, and, and on a bogus charge at that. Who got convicted? Randy Kelton. How do you spell his last name? K E L T O N. And you should be able to Google that and you should come up with Rule of Law Radio and you'll see Randy Kelton standing on like the courthouse steps with the pillars there. Uh, with Deborah Stevens, and we all went sailing in the sailboat and, uh, on the lake in Austin, Texas. And, uh, you know, and the other guys, uh, if you scroll on down, you'll see other talk show hosts, and you'll come to, uh, to uh, Greg Chapman and, and uh, Don Terry, and they're in Alabama. And uh, uh, they wanted me out a couple of times from the, from the jail. Um, there was a time in the past when Don Terry's wife uh, called me up and said, uh, these patriots, these patriots, they're all talk. And when it comes to, to my husband in jail, nobody can do anything. And, uh, I said, well, Marina, come on over and we'll, we'll get it squared away. And I uh, did up to habeas corpus and she and I went to the courthouse, uh, which in Dallas, they got this huge, I think it's about 16, 17 stories uh, called the Frank Crowley Courthouse. And behind it is the Dallas County Jail, which if I'm not mistaken, accommodates some 13,000 inmates. <laughs> oh, and, it's just like a monstrosity. Anyway, Marina and I go into the courthouse. I select a courtroom. We go into the courtroom, and the judge is at the altar. The bailiff is at his desk. There's nobody else there, just the two of them. So I spoke up as I approached the, the judge's altar, and, uh, and I spoke up and said, well, this is perfect. There's nobody else here. I'm not interrupting anything. Of an urgent matter for your immediate attention, habeas corpus. And the judge starts to look at it, and Marina, I mean, is so upset. I mean, she's literally shaking, and, and, and she wants to say something, and, and she knows we work in her mind that we have to fight grizzly bears and vampire bats to get this thing done. 
And so she, she's like, and and he senses it. You can see what is happening. And he's, he holds up his hand like like stop, like a traffic cop. And he said, Ma'am, since you have Robert Fox in the case, I'm sure everything will be okay. And I about fell over <laughs> because the standard reaction is. Get yourself an attorney and don't come back until you do. <laughs> you know, but uh, this judge knew me because he was the one where they uh, they tried to get me in the state to you know put me in the funny farm, and that was the case where they brought in Dr. Grigson against me, and I had four four doctors testifying on my behalf, and. Uh, and Dr. Tedford had the jury laughing out loud against Grigson. And uh, uh, so this judge had already seen something in his courtroom that he could hardly believe. <laughs> so so he, he looks at the habeas corpus, he said, well, I don't really have jurisdiction. I, I said, excuse me, every judge in this courthouse has jurisdiction for this. And, uh, you know, he kind of paused. And then his, his clerk came in the room he says, okay, he says, I'll tell you why. He says, you follow the clerk back there to the clerk's area and I'll go around. And so uh, Marina and I go back to the clerk's area and the judge goes through his you know, passageway that he has behind him. He goes back there and he's standing over the shoulder of, of the, the clerk who's got it on the computer and he's making notes. And then he comes to us and he says, uh, uh, he says, you know, uh, he said, Don Terry is, in fact, in the jail and so on. Uh, he said, one judge doesn't like to step on the toes of another judge. Uh, but if you'll go, this is in in uh, uh, Kristen Wade's court. And he said, if you'll go down to her court, uh, courtroom, I'm sure everything will be okay. He said, if you have any further problems, just come back and see me. So it was as nice as you could get. Marina and I go, and we go down the elevator, and we're going to Kristen Wade's court. Now, do you know the significance of that name? No. I believe you do. Not totally, but it's okay, it's this. Her dad was the one in Roe versus Wade. That was her dad. When he was, when he was a district attorney in Dallas, Texas. He litigated Roe versus Wade. And this is his daughter. I'm going into her court. So we get down there and we're greeted by the court coordinator. And it's like the red carpet treatment. <laughs> you know, I mean, as soon as we got that switch meant that there was a phone call for us. <laughs> and we get in there and uh, the court coordinator says, uh, well, we're gonna get Mr. Don Terry in here as quickly as possible and, and we'll get this thing handled. And uh, and she says, you know, we'll have it handled real quick. And uh, she departs and the bailiff who's standing right close, he steps up to us and he says, uh, well, even though they're gonna try and get him here as quickly as possible, it's you know, some bureaucratic process. And he says, it'll take about an hour. And, uh, and he said, there's a cafeteria in the basement go down there and have a coffee and a snack or whatever. And he said, if you come back in an hour, we'll get it squared away. So we went down, come back, and uh, and they brought Don Terry in, and he was released immediately. So it was like the fastest habeas corpus that, uh, you know, from presenting it to the judge to Don Terry being released was about an hour. And that was pretty darn quick. Yeah, um, yeah. We're going to we're going to uh, address that uh, off-camera stuff here momentarily. Before I forget, I was going to, you know, I'd share it with you a number of important items, like for instance, noise versus testimony. Uh, one of the things that if you're in a criminal trial, it's vitally important that you get a list from from the prosecution of all the witnesses that they intend to call and 
you need to subpoena those witnesses for yourself. Okay? And don't let them give you any guff about, you know, uh, the process and everything else. You've got to get the list to the clerks, and the clerks need to take care of it. If it's a state case, the sheriff will do service of process. If it's a federal case, it's U.S. Marshals do service of process. Okay? You shouldn't have to pay a dime for, for any of it. I mean, other than the, the paper and ink to present your list of, of witnesses to the clerk that, you know, you have, you have the people that you want, but everyone that the prosecution is going to subpoena, you want on your witness list. Now I'll explain why. Because the prosecutor's gonna ask them about ABC, and you get to cross-examine them. And, but you are, you'll find that they will argue, not necessarily, but most of the time, and especially if you're making some headway. If you're making some headway, they are going to jump up and object that you're cross-examining cross -examining outside the ABC, that little narrow block that they questioned them on. But you may want to question them on something like X, Y, Z, you know, so if the, if the prosecution questioned, well, did you have an arrest warrant? Yes, we did. And did you uh, uh, put on the handcuffs? Yes, we did. And did you take him to jail? Yes, we did. And that's fine. But you want to talk about the beating that you took when they got you to jail, you know? <laughs> and they're not going to want to hear that. Now, when you have them subpoenaed, as your witness, they are a hostile witness you get to ask them anything and even leading questions, which, you know, a lot of uh, uh, people who have, don't have the experience, they start off with telling them the situation as opposed to asking questions. But uh, you could practically do that if they're your witness and a hostile witness. So it's a tremendous advantage, and it may make the difference between winning and losing a case on that item alone. Uh, we should also mention another little tip. Um, if you have some communications, like say it's, it's a family member or, or a close friend, that's in jail, and you need to communicate something to them, like even, you know, some of the stuff that you've heard here, or, you know, stuff that you don't want the systemites to know, okay? You, if you talk to anybody in the, on the phone with the jail, you can count on it. Those calls are recorded. Everything that you send into them is photocopied. Okay, in Dallas, I don't know if you, or not, well not Dallas, but uh, in Texas, I don't know if you recall this, there was an incident where seven inmates uh, got out of the, the prison system and uh, they, they went from, uh, I think around Huntsville, north to a suburb of Dallas called Irving, and there was a shootout at an Oshman's, and then they disappeared. Uh, well, they traced back everything with regards to those guys, and even figured out the decoded messages that were had gone before that set up the prison break. And so everything, they, they record everything. And by the way, to those guys' credit, when they were caught up with in Colorado, they were in a motor home, and uh, what they had been doing is Bible study and looking for a job. All they wanted to do was get a fresh start. And they were all put to death. Um, 
the the guy who let the break. I mean, he never had any intention of hurting anybody, but there was a shootout in Irving because a police officer did come, and it's unfortunate, you know. Um, but the guy who led the break uh, spoke up and said that he did it all. He says, I did it all. Uh, Everything is my responsibility. <clears throat> execute me. Don't touch those other guys. They, you know, execute them all. Texas executes more people than anybody. It's just uh, uh, Rick Perry, the current governor, has executed 275 people. Um, and oh, and by the way, the the system. It's so oppressive, the prison system is so oppressive. Uh, in the past, uh, in the past there was a case called Ruiz, Ruiz, Ruiz uh, versus Texas, and several prisoners got together and sued the state. It was a federal case about the conditions and the treatment and they prevailed, and the feds took over the entire Texas prison system. And it's only been recently that they gave it back, and it's like, what's the point? Missouri sent prisoners to Texas because they were overloaded. At the Texas facilities, they, for, for sport, they, they put the German shepherds on them. I mean, it's one thing to say somebody uh, needs something and they figure, well, they just shoplift it because they don't have any money or whatever, and they end up in prison, okay? Prison's bad enough, but to have the dog set on you and chewing on your leg and the rest of that, I mean, that's ridiculous. Can we all agree? You know? Uh, and, and I'll share another one with you which just comes to mind here. When that case, the Ruiz case, was heard, it was before uh, uh, Judge uh, William Wayne Justice, and he declared that that the Texas prisons were, uh, you know, an Eighth Amendment violation uh, in, uh, uh, you know, cruel and unusual punishment, and uh, and he, he put the federal. Uh, take over on all of the, the whole prison system. In other cases, this guy in another case spoke up. Imagine there's a whole bunch of people in the courtroom and William Wayne Justice said to them, I take my orders from the queen. <laughs> Boy, they didn't like that. That went out you know, across the country and you may not have seen it, but that was, you know, back in the day when, when the internet wasn't what it is today. But uh, uh, he, he said that right in open court, and the system didn't like that going on very much. They transferred him out. Um, so the point being is all about communication at jail, and the point I'm getting to is this. Since they monitor the phones and they monitor the mail, how do you get a message in that's sensitive? And the way you get it in is you go to visitation, and you know they have a telephone there, that's recorded, okay? You watch to make sure where the cameras are, and so then out of camera range, while you talk about the weather, you stick your message against the glass so the inmate can see the message, and their camera doesn't get it. You like it? Okay. Um, and uh, I mentioned uh, this other one uh, earlier, you know, and in conjunction with uh, fingerprinting, and uh, the thought occurred to me maybe I didn't make it clear enough, so I'd like to make it clear enough. Uh, you know, I posed to them the question of what statute do you rely upon for summary brutality in lieu of normal fines and imprisonment? So if, 
if any of you go in and you say, I want to give them my fingerprints, and um, you know that my fingerprints are my property, and you understand this, that uh, your fingerprints, they say, are absolutely unique. And since they were created, when, when our Heavenly Father created you, he gave you a set of fingerprints that are like, unique like a, like a Picasso or whatever. You know, it's a work of art that is uh, not to be duplicated as such. And um, most people don't, also don't get the significance of the fingerprints because what they do with them in this United States government manual will tell you this. They, they put them through, they gather them up all over the country here, and they go to the East Coast, and an East Coast police agency transfers them to Interpol. And so your fingerprints go into the hands of a police force that's global. And the thing about Interpol, everybody sees that at the beginning of movies and so on, Interpol, you know, that, uh, they're a dangerous outfit. And Interpol cannot be sued in any court on the planet and is answerable to no national government. Yet the United States supports them to the tune of 30 million or more annually. Now, this is all adding up, but I'll, I'll take you a step further in this. There was a guy by the name of Race Bannon who was recruited to work for Interpol, and he wrote a book called Race Against Evil. And in that book, he laid it out that Interpol had a thousand agents operating worldwide in one section of their operation. You know, they have multiple ag agencies within there, but they have one section called Operation Archangel, and in that section they had a thousand agents around the world, each one of whom had killed between 100 to 200 people assassinations, okay? And he says that when he was recruited, he was absolutely positive that the first kill that he did was completely a righteous kill. But after that, it became less and less obvious. And so, what we're talking about, to make it specific for you, for you is if there was somebody who was wealthy and they did say child pornography and snuff movies. Now, what snuff movie means is that they kill in the end. Okay, so if they kidnap an innocent child, do child pornography and torture, and kill the child on camera, and market that for crazy people, okay? And if the guy is impossible to get, and they put a, an assassin on it to just wipe him out, okay? The, the thing is, though, like Ray said, the first kill, he was positive, was an absolutely righteous kill. But less so after that, and you know, obviously came a time when he realized that he's doing political assassinations. Now, it works, it, or could potentially work like this. Obama calls him up and says, uh, I've got a $30 million check here on my desk. But you know what? There's some of these people from Arizona that have given me a problem. And, you know, I'm not inclined to sign the check until these people are eliminated. Well, no problem. And any one of you can be popped the next day. <laughs> you know? And then the $30 million check goes out. Does that seem unreasonable? And, and the, you know, that's what they're, they're set up for. 
And, and like I say, Interpol isn't answerable to any national government and can't be sued in any court on the planet. Answer, answerable to an international court? Nothing. And they're the good guys. <laughs> If you, if you saw that movie with Clive Owen and uh, Naomi Watts called The International, you know, I mean, they got these propaganda movies to try and make them look good. But then if you check with the uh, folks with the uh, Church of Scientology, they did an investigation of Interpol and determined that Interpol was the biggest drug runners on the planet. You can imagine they could come into air, any airport and tell the, the uh, authorities, uh, you don't need to search our, our plane, we're the police. <laughs> right? Okay, good. 
Okay, thank you. So, uh, remind me, and when we're off camera, I get to make a comment on that. Okay, okay so, uh, before we go off camera, I'm going to explain something, uh, and that is about unregistered foreign agents. Um, shortly before World War II, there was a Nazi party in the United States, and they were gathering contributions and sending them overseas to Hitler to help the effort in Europe. And Congress uh, said, we've got to do something about this. So they created the Foreign Agents Registration Act. And so anyone, who, if this is to make it so that the activity would be controlled out of Washington, D.C., if there are people who are gathering information and contributions and doing so for foreign power, those three elements, then that is a highly restricted activity. And if you're collecting information and contributions for a foreign power, you must be registered in Washington, D.C. You must let them know what you're doing and you know the total extent of your your operation and then they get to say yes or no and if they say no then you don't have a foreign agent's registration and if you continue to do the activity it's a 10-year felony so um and this uh, applies even to attorneys. Like, there was an attorney by the name of Rabinowitz that was uh, representing Cuba, and Robert F. Kennedy sued him uh, about the uh, activity because he didn't have a foreign agent's registration. And uh, so, anyway, uh, don't you know that if you ask an IRS agent, do you collect information? What's the answer? They sure do, don't they? Yes, they do. Number two, do they collect contributions? Books. <laughs> <laughs> Voluntary contributions. And now, who are they working for? International Monetary That's right. They would have everybody try and they try to get everybody to believe that they're a part of the government. And like I said in the Don McCarley issue, I put in that one bit there about uh, if they were claiming to be officers of the United States, then that's a 10 year felony. So they dropped that charge altogether, but the fact of the matter is that these guys are unregistered foreign agents. Now, there's a reason why they let this stuff happen. I mean, the whole country is coming under a communist thing. And if you study the Communist Manifesto, you get to realize that the first, the 10 planks of the Communist Manifesto are in full force and effect in this country right now. And the second plank is a high a progressive income tax. So um, there's a tendency in this system to, how shall we say, protect the, the uh, issue of the income tax when um, it shouldn't be. But, uh, and by the way, did you know that the country, the income tax had a start, but before there was an income tax, the treasury had a big problem. Do you know what it was? Okay, it was That's right. They had too much money in the treasury. Treasury's bursting at the seams with, with the pressure of how much money they got, and they didn't know what to do. <laughs> well, now you get the income tax, and you got a multi-trillion dollar debt. Surprise! <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, this book, United States Government Manual, um, 
like I was mentioning before, this has got the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution right up front. And when you're, when you're going to make an argument about the Constitution or what it says, uh, you know, we've heard people say, well, you, you gotta get a certified copy of, from the archives in Washington, D.C. and the rest of that. Uh, but I've never had a problem with having this. So you can just say to them, to the, whoever you got on the stand, could you please read the, the title of this book, United, the United States Government Manual. <laughs> and then inside, you know, the Constitution and whatever else you want them to read there. You know, so, um, you got all that, then it's got, Okay, this is published by the, the United States Government Printing Office. Okay, that's why it doesn't have to be certified because anything that's printed by the government is Exactly, exactly. So and this thing, this valuable tool, you want to get this, not the new one, because the new one will cost you about 60, 65 bucks. They come out every year. But you want to get one back from the 80s or 90s. And these libraries have them, and they chuck them because the new one is up. But it's the old ones that are valuable. Why? From the 80s or 90s. Why is it more valuable? Because they have taken a bunch of stuff out. Oh. The new one is approximately half the thickness of this one. Sanitized. Sanitized. <laughs> <laughs> That's the word, sanitized. So why should they take out of it? What, okay. what of well, they stopped mentioning that the Secretary of Treasury is, in fact, the governor of the International Monetary Fund. And the citizens of Puerto Rico, isn't it? Pardon me? The citizens of Puerto Rico, not. Is what? Citizens. Oh. Um, don't know, but, you know, he could be. Could be. Uh, the point I was going to make here is this. You've seen these things. <laughs> well, you're looking at a contract, and the two signatories are here, right? Now, this says Treasurer of the United States. So this is the Treasurer of the United States. Over here, it says Secretary of Treasury, but we don't know who's Treasury. And you cannot contract with yourself. So you got this is the United States, contracting with somebody else. And the somebody else is the, is the International Monetary Fund. Not because I say so, because this book says so. Okay? So, and, and a U.S. passport will tell you that if you go into the service of a foreign power, like say for instance, we're over in Moscow at Red Square, and those guys come by in the parade, and well, gosh, look at those spiffy uniforms and the wonderful way they march. Let's join up. You join up with the Red Army, your citizenship is gone in a flash. As it may not, it, they may not happen within seconds, but as soon as the State Department finds out that you're in the service of a foreign power, your citizenship is gone. You understand? Okay, so this guy, Secretary of the Treasury, is in the service of a foreign power called the International Monetary Fund, and his citizenship is gone. Everyone who works at the United Nations, same thing. Even if you're the janitor, even if what you do is clean the latrines, sweep the floor, they pay them a bonus for the loss of citizenship. Well, there's benefits to that. Well, yeah, there's benefits to that. You know, like I explained yesterday, I'm, I'm not a citizen, and uh, so that's just the way it is. Uh, uh, the IRS attacked me and wanted to give me over 100 years and couldn't make it to first base. So, um, so, 
when when this guy becomes governor of the International Monetary Fund, and like a friend of mine in California pointed out, Geithner took the oath to the Constitution, but then as soon as he takes this office, that's gone. As a matter of fact, there's a, a, a case called Mandero versus World Bank, and you need, don't need to worry about it because here's the deal. What I'm gonna, here's the plan for the future here. <coughs> because everyone's almost, uh, probably everyone or almost everyone has an email. Well, I'm gonna be sending you a multi-page uh, uh, document about unregistered foreign agents and all this layout that I'm explaining. And so I can send it to your email, you can have it in your computer, you can update it from time to time, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And like, uh, I think you got the current guy's name in there, I think, but whatever. You can just, it's the same setup at all times. The, the Secretary of Treasury is the governor of the International Monetary Fund. He's expatriated, and what Mandero versus World Bank says is that their allegiance is 100% to the bank and the fund and zero to any other entity. That's the end of the story. So his allegiance to the United States is zero, and he's not paid one dime by the United States. His, his pay comes entirely from the International Monetary Fund. And he has diplomatic status, and that's just the way it is. Now, do you think that, you know, with all the propaganda and everything else, and they get the, uh, the children in the uh, public fool system to indoctrinate them in, in government stuff, and they actually teach them how to fill out 1040? <laughs> and, they don't teach them anything like you're learning here. <laughs> now, so they come out, they come out into the, after school, into the job market, and one of the possibilities is they might go to the IRS office and say, do you have a, an employment application I can fill out? So they fill out the employment application, they get called in for interview, they get hired. Do you think that they tell them that as they go out to be IRS agents, that they are unregistered foreign agents, that that what they're doing as soon as they start doing it is a 10-year felony? Never. 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 Okay? So, now you're beginning to see what I'm saying about this book. You want this book because in the Treasury Department, let me flip to that. Any book from the from the eighties or nineties will have this in it that it's the governor of the International Monetary Fund. So you got a twenty year spread as you look for the for the books. It's probably even in the seventies or uh, whatever. But uh, this one this one is ninety six ninety seven. Robert, yes. uh, are you saying that every TICTA agent, every IRS CID agent, are unregistered <coughs> foreign agents? Okay, I can't give you a blanket yes on that, uh, but I will explain this. 1995, uh, I testified against the International Monetary Fund in a case with Robert Carey. Uh, some of you may know that name. It's uh, K-A-H-R-E, I think it's, or K-H, whatever. I can check on it. Uh, I stayed at his parents' place, and and uh, John Nelson was running depositions and so on. And uh, I testified against the International Monetary Fund. Robert Carey's case uh, was the biggest uh, uh, raid that they'd ever done in Las Vegas history. Uh, well, that wasn't at that time. I don't think it might have been. They've done other raids against him too. Uh, he, uh, um, the, 
they were coming against him and he sued them. And John Nelson, as I explained, is like the Starship Enterprise. And he was in the background in Robert Carey's case. And, uh, and then later when they did actually the biggest raid in Vegas history, 161 counts against Robert Carey. And with John Nelson in the background, he, the IRS had zero victories with 161 counts. Okay? And this comes from understanding, you know, who these guys are. And uh, so when, when Robert Carey's response went in, it was a response from the U.S. Attorney in Las Vegas, but there was also a response from Washington, D.C. Now, the guy in Washington, D.C. that was representing him, his stuff was like, oh, this is all just a mistake because the International Monetary Fund is this wonderful organization who's helping, uh, you know, with the development of Africa and Asia and these underdeveloped countries. And, and, you know, the International Monetary Fund does nothing but wonderful things globally. Well, that all sounds okay until you read John Perkins' book, which was a New York Times bestseller called Confessions of an Economic Hitman. In that book, John Perkins was right there doing that stuff, you know, will tell you that they're involved in murder, extortion, and everything else, okay? Because they can go to some banana republic and talk to the president there and say, I've got this trunk here with $10 million in it for you personally. If we can help your country with a multi-billion dollar loan, at just 1% interest, which of course they lend them the billion, but they don't lend them the 1%. So what happens? They have to default, right? Because they can't possibly pay back the, the interest because it doesn't exist. So, you know what I'm saying? If, if, if we have these green pieces of paper and we call them foxes, instead of dollars, and, and put them out there, uh, give them 10 million of them, or 10 billion, or whatever, uh, but I don't give them the interest, all they got is that. And they can't possibly pay back the interest. And then, the, when they default, the International Monetary Fund says, oh, well, we'll help you out, we'll bail you out. Uh, sign here, we'll lend you another. 20 billion or whatever. And, uh, but it's, of course, it has to be at a higher interest rate because you're not really credit worthy. But we're really helping you out. <laughs> and so they lend them more to bail them out, and things just get worse. And the fine print says, you know, when they can't get them in the first place, by the way, they'll say, well, you've got gold mines at one end of the country and oil wells, uh, oil in the ground at the other, but you don't have the infrastructure. You don't actually have the mining equipment. You don't have the drilling equipment. You've got all these forests in between, but you've got no highways. You've got no hydroelectric. We can fix that up, you know? And they do all this stuff, and they got the stuff started. But then the country defaults on the loan, and they say, okay, well, we'll lend you more and bail you out sign here when the fine print says that the natural resources go to the international monetary fund and and you may not have been aware of it but they've been doing that here and what they did is they took from you the national parks okay and they've already issued things like passports to visit, visit the Grand Canyon. How about it? They can't take it anywhere. <laughs> I wasn't going to run my mouth today, but you provoked me. It's all my fault. 
people saw your response. And you know that the mayor of Boise, Idaho, has, has given the Chinese a huge parcel of land next to the airport so that they could land their planes there and build a little city there. Boise, Idaho is where it's right on the Snake River. And where do they come from the Snake? Where does it go into? The Columbia River. And if you were going to come into this country, how would you come into the country if you were? Well, if you were a trucker, like I was, I could keep my money and you couldn't get it. Uh, you probably delivered some containers to either Seattle, Los Angeles, or Portland, Oregon. And they have huge storage areas for these things. These storage areas where they'll take these containers, as you see the container train go by on the way in here, and they'll pack them, they'll stack them six and eight high. Now, if they were stacked with munitions and people, and all of a sudden one night the doors opened, and they started up the Columbia River killing everything they saw, which is what they're going to do. They're going to do that. Because it's the easiest possible way to get into this country. And we'll run down the Columbia River. Maybe we'll be able to stop. Maybe we won't. Uh, another, another comment in regard to what you said. I have a friend in, well, first of all, my first sergeant in my outfit overseas when I was in Germany was a guard for Elsa Cohen at the Nuremberg Trials. And he told me, exactly what what happened to some degree. She became pregnant because she was a nymphomaniac and was a screwball. She had some kind of problem. She really had a problem. But she was also a very beautiful woman. She used to parade naked in front of her troops. And uh, she tattooed beautiful designs on the backs of human people. I was telling this story in a truck stop in uh, Portland, a very famous truck stop called Chupas. Don't, don't. And a guy. Don't hold the line. Don't hold the mic. Oh, a guy there, I'm sorry, was standing over there. And everybody said, you're crazy. You don't do things like that. She tattooed these things on your back and then sit you down and give your skin off. Tat uh, I'm sorry. How, how is this relevant? Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, how is this relevant? We have four more minutes of tape. I'm sorry to bust your bubble there, but I didn't hear what you said. <coughs> Good. How is it relevant? How is it relevant? Yes. How is it relevant? It's going to happen right here. Her tattoo? Uh, I believe it's going to happen. Her right tattoo here. is relevant to what's going to happen here. Oh, what happened to that? He may. No, no. Why is it relevant to what we're talking about? The same thing's happening right now. The there same, you. the same process going on right now. The same kind of people. All right. That's what makes it. Nine, eight. <laughs> Here's Johnny. Here's Here. Here. Okay, so uh, we're on. We're on. So a, a gentleman here has, has raised an issue, and that is uh, regarding motion and limiting. And I'm going to pass out, uh, or get passed out. Uh, I, I've got to go to the computer and, and find the response. But um, basically, Motion and limiting is a relatively recent invention, and uh, the prosecution just loves to use that crap. Um, I could share with you a quick little story. So I have a friend, and uh, we've been friends, I guess, for about 15 years, and that is uh, maybe known to you as Constitution Man or Carl Miller. Anyway, uh, he's visited me in Texas, and I visited him in Michigan, and uh, we're good friends. There was a time when he was basically on his deathbed with Agent Orange poisoning me. It was a, I forget how many, three or four tours in Vietnam. So he was terribly ill, but uh, there was a radio talk show and Alan Dershowitz was on the radio talk show and extolling the virtues of motion and limiting. 
<laughs> so Carl Miller puts picks up the phone, calls in, and reads Dershowitz the riot act. It just tears him up. And Dershowitz says to the talk show host, look at the event, uh, you set me up, and you set me up with a ringer. I'll never speak on this talk show again, never. <laughs> 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 uh, because, because he got tore up by Carl Miller. And anyway, I got that stuff in, in the computer, and we'll pass it out to everybody, because it's, it's one of those things that in the process, people go into the courtroom, and they think this is a court of justice, and that they're, they're seeking justice. And then they get overwhelmed because there is none of that. And, and it's just one shyster shenanigan after another. And motion in limine is just one of those shyster shenanigans. How do you spell know, that last word? L-I-M-I-N-E. What is the exact one? Okay. It's to limit what you're going to talk about. Or that you're going to question the witnesses about. It doesn't let you present your defense. <laughs> yeah, they try and cut off your defense. Exactly correct. You know, so this last May in Cherokee County, uh, they were bringing this uh, felony charge against me. We went to trial, and the prosecution had this motion in limine. And I kept going outside and, you know, and doing my thing. The judge threatened me in the first day, he threatened me like 20 times with, with jailing me or, uh, you know, for contempt. And to the effect that, you know, I'd be in the courtroom with chains and irons on me. But I had to do what I had to do. And, and in the end, they, they didn't get a victory that they uh, figured they would. And they did, they did more than just motion in limine. Uh, in Cherokee County, Cherokee County is the only one I know of, they, that there's actually a website that documents their corruption on an ongoing basis. And so that, I got in touch with the webmaster who is anonymous. <coughs> And he's not in Cherokee County, but he certainly has contacts because he knows what's going on at all times. And I still don't know who this guy is. I, I really don't even know whether he's male or female. Um, anyway, the, the uh, thing is that uh, I go to trial and there's a jury and uh, they, the jury uh, was deadlocked and it was a mistrial. So after that, this webmaster contacts me and he informs me that at least three of the people on the jury were plants by the prosecution. One of the people on the jury was the uh, son-in-law of the sheriff. And he also happened to be a Baptist preacher. Well, I could just imagine somebody who's used to public speaking, son-in-law with the sheriff, and, and a preacher, could be a powerful influence in the jury room. And uh, one of the others was a young female, and her father worked for the Jacksonville uh, Daily Progress newspaper as a sales manager. And their uh, circulation was up with all this stuff about me. So they were running a continuous propaganda program against me and always kindling the fire and making it bigger, okay? So, and, and they, they listed as the top stories of the year, I was the top story, okay? In their podunk little newspaper. So, um, you know, and the sales manager's daughter is on my jury. How about it? <laughs> and, and then the third one was, you know, I showed you all the picture of the, the building. On the block, on the next block was a, uh, a woman, a 
Walter, who's you know socially influential, has a restaurant called Larissa House, and uh, and across the street is a police department. Well, um, various people had mentioned to me that uh, that she wanted that building, and that. Um, it's the reason why I had so many trouble, so many problems. You know, just immediately after the real estate closing comes three SWAT attacks. And uh, anyway, the the banker, her that she's associated with, some banker was on my jury. Coincidence. <laughs> so, you know. This is the kind of thing that the, the webmaster on the corruption told me in his message that this is routine with the district attorney in Cherokee County. So, um, um, yeah, I'll make a copy of the motion and limit response on that. And like I say, what, I, I just plowed ahead in my case. And let them threaten me all they want. I, I thought you mentioned that you could take it off, take it off record, and get the jury out by some kind of a bill of something or other. And I don't remember what what you called it. Yeah, um, that was we did that and two two issues. Um, uh, my friend Brady uh, helped me out and. and he, he does a lot of this stuff with the uh, Public Information Act. So, and the public, Brady uh, dug up the information. We had a, a lot of, of evidence. And it was that none of the, none of the police were valid. They didn't have their paperwork done right. There was not a single police officer that was right. The city had never created a police department, and there was, the mayor wasn't properly in office, city manager wasn't properly in office, none of the city council were properly in office. The whole shebang was completely bogus, everything. And of course, they, they uh, motioned in limine, they didn't want that stuff in the courtroom, and, and they re were refusing uh, uh, Brady's testimony, and I said, we want to do a bill, and the, the judge finally relented on that, and so uh, we got Brady and the, the jury out of the room, you know, we dismissed them for the day, and and then we put uh, Brady on, and all of that evidence is in the file. Then uh, we also had Eddie Craig, and uh, for those who don't know Eddie Craig, uh, he works with Randy Kelton, and he had been a uh, uh, either a deputy sheriff or a highway patrol or something. Anyway, that guy knows the Texas Transportation Code frontwards and backwards. We can tear him up on all of that. And um, we had his stuff brought in as a bill as well. So yeah, you could get around their tactics, and that's a very good point. I'm glad you brought that up. That if you have evidence that they just absolutely don't want to let in, say okay, have the jury out of the way, and we're going to put it in a, in a bill, and you get your witness on the stand, you get your evidence in, and it's preserved for appeal, even though the judge is saying he's not going to listen to it. And what do you call that though? Uh, they just call it a bill in Texas. Okay. Is it a bill of particulars or? No. That's um, what the West would be possible. That'll do an end run around the motion and limiting. Uh, well, to an extent. Well, but, is it but the real end run around the motion and limiting is the stuff that, that I was going to have done up for you. Okay. And none of this stuff, you understand, you know. What's being presented here is things that that can work, but you can run into a lunatic judge who, well, okay, Dr. Brooks, for instance, okay? Dr. Brooks studied out his stuff, and he had Supreme Court cases backing up his position. 
Now, he was in front of a judge by the name of Bentley. This guy is worse than anything you could possibly imagine. And, I mean, he's, he's, they know even in the courthouse that he's virtually certifiably insane. Mm. So, Brooks presents his stuff and, and, and Bentley says, well, I don't think the United States Supreme Court said that, so that's out of here. <laughs> we got the same time here. You know, I don't think he said that, so that's finished. It's out of here. <laughs> Just unbelievable. You know, I mean, Brooks is there testifying to this stuff, and, you know, I mean, I guess Brooks was probably too stunned, <coughs> the rest of us too. I mean, uh, what, what they did to me, by the way, at Brooks's trial is they had me arrested in the middle of his trial so that I couldn't help him. But the, the prosecutor claimed that, that they had a warrant for my arrest. Two bailiffs took me out of the courtroom, you know, to a, another part of the courthouse and sit and wait, you know. And there was no warrant for my arrest, even though the prosecutor, the district attorney said there was. And by the time, and they, they called the U.S. Marshals, and those guys came down, and they said, well, Mr. Fox, you sent a letter to a, a judge in uh, Wisconsin. And uh, I said, yeah. And they said, well, did you intend to threaten the judge? I said, you know, this is at the time, okay? He said, look at me, I'm blind and I'm crippled. And who am I gonna threaten? I'm like Mr. Magoo. <laughs> and they, they laughed out loud themselves, you know? And, and uh, so anyway, uh, they, they said, well, uh, well, Mr. Fox, we just, you know, uh, have to check on these things to make sure it isn't a threat. And, uh, no, it's no threat at all. But see, like, you know, like the judge, for instance, Tyler could say that I had threatened him because I, I said that uh, man stealing, uh, the, the punishment for man stealing is death. But you can't take things out of context. I said the punishment in the Bible, at Exodus twenty one sixteen, the punishment for man stealing is death. So I didn't threaten the judge with death, just informed the judge that the Bible says that's death. Right? I didn't threaten to kill anybody. And from my perspective, I've already seen it. You know, two officers that arrested me in separate, separate incidents, uh, separate arrests and separate incidents for them because they were in different places. You know, one of them got turned to mush on the freeway. Just smacked with a pickup truck and blown to bits. <laughs> so, you know, that's what they get. I mean, they do evil, and then, you know, our Heavenly Father just whacks them. It's just the way it is. No threat at all. Um, so, uh, uh, Carla raise the issues of subpoenas uh, and that you subpoena certain parties and like I say, I subpoenaed the reporter from NBC um, when I subpoenaed the reporter from NBC that was a television station in Tyler, Texas in Jacksonville's 30 miles south uh, not that that's a big deal but they got attorneys from Houston to respond. And the attorneys from Houston put in a motion to quash my subpoenas. Now, um, that's the kind of thing that happens, okay? So you have to be sort of prepared for that. And you have to be able to justify, um, you have to be able to justify that the relevance their testimony to your case and things like that. So, you know, they don't let you just harass all kinds of people out there. It has to be something reasonable. 
that you can make a connection between their potential testimony and your case. And that's how that goes. Um, um, one question. The state is always the plaintiff in every action. Can the state be subpoenaed? That's a real good one now, isn't it? Okay. The the state obviously is a fiction. It's a piece of paper. But um, you could potentially subpoena the Secretary of State. You could potentially subpoena the Governor. And um, you could subpoena the legislative record as to uh, you know, the law and uh, various aspects of that. And then in your local area, wherever that might be, you know, the, the district attorney, his assistant, they are allegedly representing the state, and so you possibly subpoena them. And some of this stuff, these subpoenas, if you uh, subpoena the right people with the right issues, they may drop your whole case right there on that alone. Because when they know that you're headed to a certain direction and that you could potentially beat them and cause a big problem with, you know, because let me say this, the trial court judge may be able to try and run over top of you, but then, like uh, Mike has, has said, you do a bill, and that's what I did with, with Brady stuff and, and Eddie Craig stuff preserve it for appeal. But then, of course, the jury was deadlocked and, and, uh, and it was a mistrial. Um, but you have to have, you, you have to do the best you can to get the evidence that you need in. Subpoena the, the right people, ask the right questions. If they don't want to let you get it on the record, you get it in, in any way with a bill and you take it the distance. And they will get scared if they do like real dirty work at the trial court level, they don't like for the appeals court, their bosses, to be looking at what kind of jerks they are and how ignorant they are. You know, I mean, they helped me in Cherokee County, they helped me beyond the legal limit. And boy, they didn't want to talk about that one. You know, because my, my take on it is they got no excuse. How, how could ignorance of the law be an excuse for the judge and the district attorney? <laughs> Would you subpoena, consider, uh, consider subpoenaing um, the Secretary of the Treasury in an IRS case? Yeah, I would. My question is, so often when, when suits are brought against... You, sh you want to come to the microphone so... Yeah. Not enough? Yeah. No, yeah. go to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. My question is, if, when a suit's been brought against you nine out of ten times, it says United States of America. Okay. And my question is, can we subpoena the United States of America? Or who is the United States of America? Who has... Who is the real party of interest? Who has the first-hand evidence? And I can't get through any of this stuff because no one has. You're, you're kind of tried on presumptions with a mysterious witness that you can't seem to find. The United States of America in 3002, Title 28, is a corporation. That's right. That's the United States, States, though, not the United States of America. Right, the United States. The United States is a corporation. All capital letters. Right. Oh, just the United States only. Right. Because when they bring out the president, he doesn't say America. He says United States. <clears throat> Look up on Diamond Brand Street. This court case, the United States of America, and it's upper lower case. Wow. So tell me who it is. Yeah. Well, and now that you mention that, make something here. But isn't, isn't that true just about in every case? 
there's, it's all based on presumption, and there is actually no witness against you in just about every case that you can possibly be charged with. Isn't that the fraud that goes around? I agree. Is it? Yeah. Great topic. Sorry, just keep in mind. People are here from Maricopa County. I'm trying to get trying to get an idea so we can maybe go into what we can do to get the uh, county recorder to start acting right. In terms of regards to the notices, oh, in regards to putting anything in there, recording. I've got something. Unless it's got something. Actually, that part doesn't even matter. Um, I have to find the reference, but apparently this works the same in every state, and I got this information from Howard Griswold, who's a phenomenal commercial remedy person, but it's um, pretty difficult to get um, information from him directly. But in any case, in the state of Arizona, and supposedly in every state, um, if you have filed your documents, and you have provided the appropriate fee for it, legally it is considered recorded. So the way you do it is you don't go there personally because you'll have problems with them getting to accept it and all that. You put it in the mail, send it registered with the fee, and even if they do reject it, by law it is considered recorded as long as it meets whatever recorded requirements they have. On, on, on the microphone, on the microphone, on the microphone. <laughs> the, re the requirements that they refer to are not arbitrary. They are very specific. So, so, so one of the examples is um, if the appropriate fee is not provided, they don't have to accept it. Um, one of the other ones is if it's a financial statement, it has to list the debtor, the creditor, stuff like that. Those, those are the kind of exceptions that um, that say that uh, they can reject it. So there are very specific requirements that have be, to be They'll met. be listed in the statute. Right, they'll be listed in the statute. And af after you read them, you'll understand that they, they can reject it for other reasons, but if one of those reasons is not one of the ones listed in the statute, then it's considered recorded even if they do reject it. With a third party witness registrations. You said that you didn't want to do it yourself. You have somebody else do the mailing. Right. Well, no. You can do the mailing yourself. See, the problem is a lot of the complaints are that when people go, like, say, with their freedom documents or whatever they're trying to file, that they go there personally. The recorder looks at the documents and decides, well, I don't want to file these, and then you're kind of stuck. So to get around that, what you do is you mail the doc, you mail the documents. They receive them in the mail. You send it certified mail, so you have a certificate that they have received it. And as long as it contains the fee and whatever recording requirements that are supposed to be in there, even if they reject it, at that point it is considered recorded legally, even if they don't record it. How do you get a certified copy of that recorded document? You don't. You don't need the, the the distinction is it's considered recorded once it's received with the fee. That's it. How do I get a certified copy to take it to court? The whole reason I'm filing it 
No, you don't need a certified copy. The only thing you need to verify or certify is that they received the documents. So you need a witness. You attach it. The, the witness. Right. The U.S. Postal Service is the witness. The document you filed, you put the certification number on top of the document. You don't have a certification number. They you write one. it in the document. They don't give you one. No, no. no. Certified mail. Certified. Yeah, you send it certified mail, and when they receive it, the U.S. Post Office sends back that certification, or you can get a copy of it on the internet or whatever. It doesn't meet but, the rules of The actual statute for, for Arizona Revised Statutes, it's Title 47, and um, it's 9516. It says, except as otherwise provided in subsection B of this section, communication of recording to a filing office and tender of the filing fee or acceptance of the record by the filing constitutes a filing. Or the acceptance. That's, that's what Right, but right. Well, that device is not allowed in the courtroom. It's given by confiscator. For those for those people that have a federal case, they'd be interested in this. But something similar happens in the state anyway. Um, this this one here along the top. With the district court in lowercase, this district court was created by the Judiciary Act in the 1700s. Okay, and now you'll see that they do, they do their oaths and other stuff in this court, but you get tried. You, you know they'll come against you in this. Now, it's an interesting arrangement because, um, well, let's say this. In Tim and Don's uh, IRS case, uh, the jurisdiction issue was challenged, and the judge's response was that they had jurisdiction, and he cited in numerous cases, and they were all this, the day the one that was created by the Judiciary Act. Only thing is, this is the one that's trying Tim and Don. Did you bring that up to him? Oh yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're you know, we've got stuff that, uh, you know, again, I can send you that stuff. Okay, do we have access to those pleadings? Yeah. Through you, yeah. we got yeah. connections? Yeah, good. You got connections. All right. You're, you're a good guy. Yes, you got connections. All right, good. That, that material will be available on PACER, would it not? <laughs> yeah. For their case? Yeah. Yeah, because the stuff has gone back and forth. Of course, it's been a hell of a battle. I'd be willing to download it and put it up on my website for everybody to go look at the documents if you want. So I'll get, it, get the case number from me. Sure. Yeah. 
I just stick it under there like a lot of the other cases. Which website? ResearchSociety.org. What is it? ResearchSociety.org. And there's a bottom bottom that says cases, and I, I'll put it under there. That sounds to me like you're proposing Next collaboration. Jim and Don's case. I can give it Yeah, we'll get the case number to do that. So, uh, how, how do you hold the judges accountable for breaking law? I think that's the biggest issue everybody has here. Yeah. Okay, there's a, What's the remedy you have for that? You can do a complaint against the, uh, the judge or any attorney, uh, and you know, the bar complaints, they, they would appear to do nothing about them, and that's pretty well correct as far as the bar goes. But all these attorneys have to be bonded, and when they get their third complaint within a year, they can't get bonded, and that takes them out. So that's... Third, third complaint from three different people? Or three different instances? Um, could be three different incidents, one guy, I suppose. It's the third complaint, you know? And uh, and then with regards to uh, federal judges, uh, my friend Michael Brown had two federal judges removed from the bench. Wow. And, and wow. The, the way he did it, this is, this is really good because you can complain about federal judges and you're not going to go anywhere. But what Michael Brown did, because he's teaching seminars and such, um, he would take a, a part in the seminar and he'd have a table set up and he'd have some of the pleadings on the table so that everyone could come and look at the stuff. And I guess he had the right parts highlighted or whatever. And so you could look at the pleadings and see what went on, and then you could fill out the complaint from you and send it into the Senate Judiciary Committee on judicial uh, conduct. And he didn't have like one, two, or three complaints going in. They were like two or three thousand. So you can imagine they have like personnel files just like they had, the police department has personnel files under cops. And, you know, there's a difference if the guy's got no complaints and his file is pretty thin, you know. But if somebody's got a wad of complaints, then you can imagine when it hits two or three thousand complaints, it's a block. And uh, he, you know, blew off two federal judges that way, right off the bench. Like they weren't just. I think they were gone. So you could do complaints like that. And another thing is, uh, you might want to look at Randy Kelson's web website. And uh, there's criminal complaints there. And when you, you know, <clears throat> bring criminal complaints against them, you may or may not get the handcuffs on them, but you'll sure get their. Uh, the system riled up about the situation. Yeah, you get their attention. Carlin? It's my understanding from a reliable source that you go after them on not what they did do, but what they didn't do. Okay. Dereliction of duty, you talked about. Breach of duty? That's yeah, it's I, easier to prove I the concept. It's easier to prove something yeah. they did not do and they were supposed to than you have to prove that which they did. It's much easier to make some better performance. I think, the, I think what that means is by, by stating what they did not do explains the violation of law that they broke. It was actually a judge that told me that and um, it wasn't elaborated on. Just what I was told, the exact words were, because I asked the same question, and I was told you get them on not what they did, but what they didn't do. This is, that's how you get them. That makes sense. Because it's like, this is the law. And they didn't so take this. it for whatever it's worth. Okay. Um, now we're doing time.
time was? So it's 11.52. Um, we got plenty of tape, right? Yes. We have 30, so we, 37 minutes left. Okay. Uh, did you want to take lunch at 12, or we just go for the 37 minutes and then take lunch? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. That's fine. So um, um, you want to distribute those? Okay. Is that 